On the virtual Bible study tonight, we want to talk about Lot, a lot of things about Lot that were good and admirable. In fact, God calls him righteous. He lived in a wicked world, much like ours, and so there are some important lessons we can learn. Tonight, we're looking at Lot, and we're going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 one three eight one four five six seven or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com we hope you'll take out your bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of god's word on this edition of the virtual bible study and this is the virtual bible study for thursday april 12th 2018 we're glad that you're with us tonight on the program and we look forward to hearing from you at 877-381-4567 email questions at collegeview.com and sign in the chat room if you're watching us on our webpage tonight. Uh, you also, you'll need to check us out on YouTube tonight. Where, uh, the link to the, at the website is not there. But uh, if you, we would like you to sign in the chat room at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com, and share your comments there. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is out of town tonight. And uh, so we'll be flying without him, and we'll look forward to your help in the discussion tonight. Uh, Kyle's behind the controls tonight. Kyle, welcome to the program. It's always good to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to have you here as well. We look forward to hearing from you again. Uh, we want to hear from you anytime throughout the week. Questions at collegeview.com. You can suggest topics for future editions of the Virtual Bible Study. You can send in your questions, and maybe you just like to have a question answered in private, or if you just uh, maybe you know the answer to a question, but you think it'd make a good topic for discussion on the Virtual Bible Study. Questions at collegeview.com is the email address to use at any time to contact us. We also have uh, bumper stickers we'd like to share with you so you can help get the word out uh, on uh, your car as you're sitting in traffic. Help spread the word. If you'll send us your snail mail address to questions at collegeview.com, we'll get those in the mail to you free of charge. And you can stick them on your window where they won't be vehicle or anything, but it'll help, you, uh, help us to get uh, the word out. Questions at collegeview.com. Dot com is the email address to use. We're talking about Lot tonight on the program. Lot was a righteous man, according to God, according uh, to what he says in First Second Peter chapter two, verses seven and eight. Lot was a righteous man, yet he lived in a wicked world, and uh, a world that many have paralleled to the world that we live in today. Uh, many people uh, sort of parallel the society we live in today with that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, and so since Lot was able to maintain righteousness in that terribly wicked city, the question is, what uh, characteristics did he have in his life that we should be imitating in our life uh, so that we can maintain our righteousness? Earlier today, we sent out some questions for you to consider, some of the, the topics we want to cover tonight. Uh, how did Lot maintain his righteousness? Uh, Lot was hospitable. Uh, the first question we ask, what, what impact did this have on him, and why was it important for him then as it is for us now? Number two, uh, the wicked of, wickedness of the world and the society that Lot lived in is said to have oppressed him and tormented him. Uh, how can we have the same reaction to our society today and the sin that is around us? Number three, Lot was willing to sacrifice to serve God. In what ways might we have to make similar sacrifices today? And then finally, number four, Lot was willing to be in the faithful minority. What might that mean for us today? And how can we gain the courage uh, to be willing to be in the minority? Definitely not a comfortable position. Lot was willing to take that position. He even endured some ridicule because of his desire to be faithful to God. How can we... Get courage uh, to be like Lot. Look forward to hearing from you on the program tonight. Again, 877-381-4567. Email questions at collegeview.com. Use the chat window and share your comments with other listeners there. As we look at Righteous Lot and the lessons we can learn from him, no doubt we live in a wicked world, uh, Kyle. Is, uh, uh, no doubt you've heard people compare our society to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet Lot was able to maintain his righteousness. As we read in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, uh, God delivered righteous Lot, 
who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them, his soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Lot, Lot is described there as righteous three times. Righteous Lot as a righteous man, had a righteous soul, and yet that was a, it was a terribly wicked, uh, filthy society uh, with lawless deeds, a, a terrible place to live, not some place you'd want to live, yet Lot maintained his righteousness. Oh, yeah, which I think uh, even if we look at our own world under the same microscope, if they were to look at, if people from that time were to compare our world or to look at our world, I'm sure we would get the same uh, uh, examples. Like our world is very, it is very wicked, uh, and Lot... I think sometimes does get a a bad connotation with him, but the thing is, it's he he's a human. He has made mistakes, and we, of course, have made mistakes as well. So it's just we have to be careful how we compare ourselves to Lot and our world to theirs, because they may not be as far as apart as we think they are. So. All right. Now uh, we do need to note, or uh, before we go any farther, uh, Lot is called righteous here, but he's not perfect. We uh, know there's lots of ins- uh, lots of people would call upon maybe the. Instance in Hebrew, in Genesis chapter six, I believe it is, uh, where um, Lot is uh, selfish. Uh, that uh, he was uh, actually Hebrews eleven, uh, Genesis chapter thirteen. I'm sorry, verse six, uh, where uh, Lot makes a selfish decision, takes the best for himself. We remember that about Lot. That's definitely not an admirable characteristic. No doubt, many of you remember the incestuous relationship he had with his daughters. Uh, that, uh, again, uh, overshadows some of his life. But Lot was deemed righteous by the things that he had done here. We look at Hebrews chapter 11 for a, lot, a list of a lot of people who in that uh, f- face hall of fame were mentioned that had lots of flaws. Samson's in there. Uh, David's in there. Even Rahab the harlot. Uh, so definitely uh, all have uh, skeletons in their ear closet, uh, so to speak. Uh, but uh, we can be forgiven of those things, and we can be uh, righteous by uh, following the instructions that God has given us for pardon. Um, So Lot is in that category, uh, but certainly some admirable things here in his life that we need to be emulating. The first of those we want to talk about tonight is the fact that Lot was hospitable. We ask what impact did this have on Lot, and why was it important for him then as it is now. You know, the pages of the Bible are uh, just full of examples of hospitality and admonitions to be hospitable. And Lot certainly is one of those examples. In Genesis chapter 19, beginning of verse 1, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. And wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Uh, Lot here is uh, not taking no for an answer. He sees these strangers, uh, and he has an opportunity to serve them, and he's intent on doing just that. Certainly, uh, that would be you would think a dangerous situation to strangers come up and you're inviting them into your house. He didn't know them. Uh, He apparently had no uh, indication that they were coming, no advance warning. Uh, Was the house clean? Did Mrs. Lott have enough provisions uh, in the house ready to serve company? Um, Was it a good time? It had been a busy week uh, in Sodom. Uh, We don't know those details, but he was intent on serving his, uh, those guests, uh, he begged them, he pressed upon them greatly, and when they did uh, take him up on his invitation, he was very generous, he made them a feast. Uh, Lot was serving others, and uh, as an example for us all. Yeah, well, especially, I think, we, uh, we probably can find it easy to emulate that whenever we have uh, someone traveling or someone's uh, brother or sister in Christ who's... Um, we have someone for a meeting. We can easily reach out to them and offer our homes to them and offer. I just, I really think he knew these were men of God, of course. So he was, he knew that the world was, at the, the place they were living in, uh, that Sodom was very wicked. So he needs to get these guys, especially these guys, he needs to get, he needs to get them inside and out of this situation as soon as possible. We need to do, not necessarily be uh, to that level, them inside, but we offer our homes and make sure we're offering those who we know 
who need assistance. Make sure we're offering that and opening up our homes and our, our pantries and making sure that they're cared for. So. Yes. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, the statement is made, Be not forgetful to enters, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, it doesn't call out Lot specifically, but certainly this is what happened to Lot as he entertains these two angels, uh, and uh, they were strangers to him. But uh, that's Lot's example that is being referenced here in Hebrews 13, verse 2, or, or other examples. The, the command and instruction for us is to do the same, to follow the example, to entertain strangers. Uh, and uh, that indicates that we maybe uh, need to be helping out and taking the care of those who, who don't know all that well. Not just our friends and our family, but uh, our close, uh, close acquaintances, but even strangers. Uh, we need to have the attitude of serving others and um, taking care of their needs. In Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, talk about the idea of taking care of those who may not be able to repay us, that we're not just doing this because it's going to help us. You know, I'll have Kyle, I'll have you over for steaks because I know you're going to have me over for lobster next weekend. Uh, no, uh, we're going to help those who cannot help themselves. In Luke chapter 14, beginning verse 12, then he said also to them, Jesus said that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made to thee, but when thou makest a feast, call the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And so it's not just a, I'm going to do this because of what, what I can get out of it. I'm going, to, I'm going to be hospital. I'm going to serve my brethren and my fellow man because of what they need. And I think Lot had that. Uh, that attitude here, obviously, as he's, he doesn't know these strangers, he's just concerned about their well-being and what they need, and so he was going to address that need, and it's an example for us today, even in the wicked society that we live in today. Yeah, which it's, uh, we don't need to worry about, uh, especially in that kind of instance, if it's someone who's, uh, if it's a right now, we don't have to go out and you don't have to necessarily go buy or spend your money to make sure that there's just you could just open up your cup of coffee or a glass of ice or iced tea and stuff like that, which uh, in uh, uh, Jesus in uh, Mark uh, 941 says that uh, we offer a cup of cold water in his name is because we belong to him and that we don't lose our reward. That's exactly and right. You can't, uh, yeah, you can't want for more than that. So uh, that's, that's exactly right. In Romans chapter 12, verse 13, Paul instructs distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. We're to be distributing to the needs of our brethren uh, and it, encompassing that is this idea of being given to hospitality. It's in our nature. Our desire is to serve those who have need. We need to be doing that. We need to make sure that we're following that instruction. As you referenced uh, Jesus' instructions, uh, Kyle, in Matthew chapter 25, a very familiar passage on this idea of hospitality and taking care of the needs of those who are around us. Matthew 25, verses 34, beginning. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed to my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Well, when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so Jesus is commending these, and he goes on to commend those who neglected to show concern and care for their fellow man. He's, he's commending them in the fact that they're being hospitable. Uh, Lot is an example to the, of us in, in that as well. Lot was hospitable, concerned about the needs of others. Widows in First Timothy chapter five verse ten uh, were not to be taken into the number if uh, they hadn't had this characteristic of being hospitable. Uh, they did, let not a widow verse nine of First Timothy chapter five let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers. If she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Uh, that's the expectation 
of us as Christians, and this these widows would be uh, just manifesting that they had followed that or accepted that uh, expectation of being hospitable. Yeah. I think especially uh, for families that have children, I think it's a it's, it's huge uh, practice. It's a practice hospitality if you're showing your children what to, what, what to do, and just really it's a extremely you're planting that seed into them and knowing what their what kind of behavior is called upon for a christian so that's something that's to think about as well it's just a great opportunity though uh, to open your home when you have children okay <clears throat> all right and so um here's uh, something else to consider as well that it's an expectation of those who would be elders again uh not just uh, limited to elders the expectation that elders would be those who would be hospitable first timothy chapter 3 verse 2 uh, this is a true stain, stain of a bishop. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, uh, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Uh, uh, someone who's going to be an, an elder needs to be someone who's devoted to this, given to hospitality, given to taking care of the needs of others and and providing for the needs of others. In First Timothy chapter, or, I mean, sorry, in Titus chapter one, verse eight. Uh, the the qualifications of elders given there say that this man is one who is a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Someone who loves hospitality, loves the association of those who are good. That is uh, what is the expectation of elders. I'd say it's an, 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 an something that we all ought to be striving for. And it appears to be uh, something that was characteristic of Lot in his life. And the example we see here of him begging these two angels to come and lodge in his house and him providing a feast for them once they accepted his invitation. Uh, certainly, Lot is righteous in his time and his wicked society. Hospitality was an important part of that. We'll continue the discussion about hospitality on the other side. We'll look forward to your comments along these lines. Lot was hospitable. Why do you think it was important to him that he, he was hospitable? Why do you think it helped him maintain his righteousness in that wicked society? And why is it important to us today in the wicked society that we live in? Why is it important that we today be practicing hospitality? We'll look for your comments in the chat room or over email tonight. Don't go anywhere. The Virtual Bible Study will continue right after this. Have you checked out all of the resources on collegeview.com lately? Check it out now while you listen to these important messages. The Virtual Bible Study will be right back after this. Hello. Hey, Matt. No, I don't have any plans for Friday night. What are you doing? Oh, I won't be able to go with you to watch that movie. Because, Matt, the movie is rated R. Hey, why don't you just come over and hang out at my house Friday night? Great. I'll see you there. Being pleasing to God means that you may have to be different than the crowd. But don't be afraid to stand up for what's right. It just might find that it's easier than what you expect. A message brought to you by College of Church of Christ. My name is Steve Novorak, reminding you to listen to the Virtual Bible Study every Thursday night at 8 o'clock Central Time. Use your internet connection for something good. Listen to the Virtual Bible Study every week. Now, back to the program. And we're back on the program tonight as we look at Righteous Lot. Lived in a wicked society, much like ours. Not uh, Ours, I don't believe, is as bad as Lot's. Uh, and yet, he's able to maintain his righteousness. So what characteristics did Lot have? that we need to be emulating in our life today. 877-381-4567. The number is toll-free and the line is open. We'd love to hear from you tonight as we talk about Lot and look to his example and ways that we can imitate that and maintain our righteousness in the wicked society we live in. Lot was hospitable, and uh, he entertained these angels, brought them into his house, begged them to come to his house, and prepared a feast for them. First Peter chapter 4, verse 9 tells us to do the same, says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Again, it's not just a suggestion that we be hospitable. It's not just a good idea for us to be hospitable in addressing the needs of our fellow man. It is a command. Use hospitality. And we're to do so without grudging. We don't need to be bitter about this. You know, oh, I got to, uh, it's going to take a lot of my time to do this or they're going to, you know, it's going to take a lot of money, a lot of my resources to be providing for my brethren and my fellow man. No, we're instructed to use hospitality 
without grudging. We need to be diligent in doing that. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 6 says, uh, sorry, Hebrews 13 verse 16 says, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Certainly there's going to be some sacrificing involved in this. Yet God is pleased when we're sacrificing of ourselves to take care of the needs of those who are around us. So Lot was hospitable. In, in John chapter 13, verse 14, Jesus gives us his example. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus was willing to take the opportunity to serve his, his fellow man. We must do the same. So why was it important, Kyle, would you say, for Lot to be hospitable in that wicked society? How do you think that helped him uh, maintain his righteousness? Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, uh, I just look, if you look back in the previous chapter, whenever um, Abraham was making his appeal uh, uh, to save uh, Sodom, it, uh, he doesn't necessarily say that Lot is among, you know, he doesn't necessarily for, point out Lot to save, you know, could you save Lot? I think it's, uh, he has to, he has to separate himself from those. It's, I think it goes along with counting himself as righteous enough to be saved. Uh, so he's, it's called upon him to be righteous and to be hospitable. So he's um, in following along with being righteous and knowing what he's doing and trying to be a man of God. He has to, it's incumbent upon him to, to serve others and to be hospitable. So. All right, I've got some ideas on this, Kyle, that I put to sort of scribbled down here. Why did it help uh, Lot? I think it helped him because he was in a self-indulgent society, a society that was all about pleasure and what they wanted, their desires. Hospitality tells you to do just the opposite of that, doesn't it? It's not about your desires, fulfilling your desires. It's about what your fellow men need and uh, what God expects of you. So I think it helped him maintain his righteousness because it was a different mindset than the society around. It wasn't just about me and my needs and my wants and my pleasures and my desires. It's about what others around me need. Uh, I think that helped him maintain his, his righteousness. I think it helped him maintain his righteousness because he was laying up treasures in heaven when he, as he's serving men. He's not just piling things up for himself. He's helping others. He's laying up those treasures in heaven. And Jesus tells us where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. So his heart was not on the, the, the present day. His, his heart's on heaven because of the way he's living, the, the way that he's uh, using his resources, the way he's being hospitable to others. I think, uh, as Hebrews chapter 13 referenced, I think, uh, 13 verse 2, it, even if it wasn't, uh, if that's not referencing a lot about men entertaining angels unaware, no doubt... Lot did entertain angels, and so his hospi hospitality brought him into contact with good men. He was blessed as a result of being hospitable and encouraged as a result of being hospitable. We will be as well if we won't, if we'll, uh, especially with our brethren, show hospitality and, and, and invite them to our homes or provide for their needs in other ways. We'll be brought in contact with good men. That will be an encouragement to us in this wicked world that we live in. Our brethren need that association. We need that association. Uh, there's benefits all around if we will pro practice hospitality as Lot did. And then finally, I think Lot uh, benefited and maintained his righteousness as a result of hospitality because he was still doing what he could. He didn't give up. He didn't say, you know, this world's wicked. I'm just, uh, there's nothing I can do. In his, crawl back in his hole and just stay there. He was still busy doing what God wanted him to do. He didn't give up. He didn't quit, even though he lived in a wicked world. And we have to have the same outlook and perspective. That's very true. It's, uh, it's, we can't. It's, we're, not, we're supposed to be out in the world and trying to save others and trying to do what we can, just like Lot is, trying to do what we can to save, to save them. And it's, the world may push back, which is we're going to probably get into some of that just shortly. So yeah. <clears throat> the world may rebel against what we're trying to say, but we still need to persevere and try to try to reach the loss. So. All right. Here's what Kent in Calhoun, Georgia says about it. He says, I find it interesting that in the, Bible, the study of biblical examples, God has always placed a high premium upon his people demonstrating an attitude of hospitality. A high premium, Kent says. 
In the case of Lot, he demonstrated hospitality to angels of God. By his willingness to receive the instruction that they provided for him, he was able to escape the destruction and judgment of God that fell on Sodom. There is an important principle to be found in this account. While we do not find ourselves in circumstances such as Lot with regards to the entertainment of angels today, by our association with faithful Christians, one can receive both encouragement and instruction from the scriptures to be separate from sin and worldliness. And so Kent's uh, picking up on that same idea of associations. And as the world is becoming apparently increasingly wicked, Kyle, it would seem no better time than now for us to be seeking the association and company of our brethren. And we can do that by practicing hospitality. Oh, yes. It's, uh, we need to value every opportunity we have to, of course, associate with uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also we need to use that to charge our, uh, I'd say, for lack of a better term, our batteries, I guess, our spiritual, we need to uh, grow stronger spiritually and then take that knowledge and take that wisdom out into the world. So we need to, it just needs to... We need to use that, use that opportunity to grow stronger and then take it to the world. All right. 877-381-4567. Yeah, the chat room is quiet tonight. Uh, use the chat room and send us your thoughts. Uh, it, it, it may not be uh, apparent, uh, Josh but, or Kyle, it may not be apparent or obvious that hospitality would help in a wicked society, but I think it does. I think it's apparent that it does. Uh, it may not be our first choice, or it might be, may not just be, uh, our, you know, just a natural reaction for us to say, you know, the world's wicked. I need to be practicing hospitality. But certainly, we see that it helped uh, a lot, no doubt, and it will help us as well. Well, it's. I think the world is growing increasingly uh, selfish too. So it's uh, when someone, people are surprised. They're actually shocked whenever you're just you're nice. People don't see nice much anymore. So no. whenever you're nice and you. Even a simple like opening the door for someone or just uh, offering them something to drink if they're just yeah, right. yeah just if you're just being nice it does not take much mm -hmm. and uh, even the simple things of being hospitable you don't have to plan a whole full meal just whatever you do and the simplest things that in itself will plant uh, a seed in them just even if uh, you take that opportunity you don't have to necessarily um, start preaching the gospel to them at that moment but you know you really see that this is these people this is they're different so we need to. I think you'll people will start recognizing that. And that's something that they will definitely be surprised by, and it's something to do. So. All right. An interesting question is posed in the chat room tonight. So how do we prioritize hospitality with those we know versus strangers, or how do we combine the two? It's a good question. Uh, thank you, 9583, for that. And uh, I think we have instructions for both. Uh, we have instructions that we need to be using hospitality one to another without grudging in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. Um, and so I think that would be referencing to, uh, to those who are brethren and those that we know. Hebrews 13, verse 2 tells us to entertain strangers. So I think we have instructions to do both. And, uh, and in, the, in our society, I don't though, typically have people who are needing lodging overnight, but there may be other needs that we can supply, whether we do that in our home or we do that outside of our home, uh, being sure to make sure that we address the needs of those who are around us. Good question tonight. Hopefully that uh, is an acceptable answer according to the scriptures. If you have other thoughts that you'd like to share, anyone else has other thoughts to share? Send those in the chat room now. Why don't we take a break? When we get back, we've got to get to the next point because Lot is an incredible example in this aspect. His Second Peter reference there in Second Peter chapter uh, two, verses seven and eight. Lot was vexed or perplexed or tormented, oppressed by the wickedness that was around him. He lived in a terrible society, but he wasn't callous to that society. It was bothering him. It was it was tormenting him. The society that he lived in. Can we say that about ourselves today? Does the sin in the world around us today torment us, vex us, oppress us? Does it upset us? The wickedness that we see in the world around us today, it needs to. We need to learn from Lot in that, and we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. We'll get this week's bullet point. We'll get your thoughts on the other side. Don't go anywhere. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Now you can listen to a podcast of a recent sermon every week. Find out more at collegeview.com. There's more of the virtual Bible study right after these important messages. Tonight on Channel 8 WSIN, it's TV like you've never seen it before. 
Starting at 8, it's TV's funniest new comedy, Fornication in the City, and Marie has been misbehaving again. Guess what? I just cheated on my husband. He doesn't even know about it. <laughs> and then at 8.30, it's the show that's setting the standard. You won't want to miss this week's I Love This World, where Bob makes a great announcement. Well, I think it's time you knew the truth. I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> and at 9 o'clock. It's the show that Television Magazine has called the number one drama for murder and violence. You won't want to miss this week's In Cold Blood to see who will be the next to be gunned down. It all starts tonight at 8 o'clock on Channel 8 WSIN. I'm Greg Gwynn reminding you that sin is a terrible thing and that those who are entertained by watching others sin fall under the condemnation of God that is mentioned in Romans 128. Be careful what you watch on television because in spite of what the devil wants you to think, sin is always sin and it's never funny. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. No one can dispute that we live in the most prosperous time in history. In fact, ours is the most prosperous nation in the world, and we are the most materially blessed people of all time. No other group of people, living or dead, has ever enjoyed the advantages we possess. Lesson one, be thankful. The problem, of course, is that these blessings of money, material possessions, leisure time, and personal liberties will become our spiritual downfall. Consider some of the challenges that are presented by our prosperity. First, it's easy to become consumed by the ambition to obtain more and more. Solomon, perhaps the richest man who ever lived, wrote, quote, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. With abundance comes an increased appetite for even more. Also, this desire for more worldly goods presents a whole new array of temptations. Paul warned that, quote, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and hurtful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. Our news is filled with reports of corruption at the highest levels of government and business. The underlying cause is the love of money. And note that you don't have to be rich to suffer these temptations. You only have to want to get rich, as the text says. Many have suffered the ruin and destruction, both physical and spiritual, of such desire. As the pursuit of riches and possessions continue, men invariably allow God to be crowded out of their lives. Many a Christian has neglected his spiritual duties while salving his conscience with the excuse, I must earn a living. God, on the other hand, has promised that if we will put his kingdom first, quote, all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, verse 33. May we all have the faith to trust him in this way. Our prosperity is a huge spiritual threat. Be careful. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Colossians 3, 17. Now back to the program. We're back on the program tonight and uh, a pertinent bullet point because apparently the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah were that wealthy area. You know, they're lot, that fertile ground, that's what drew Lot to it. And so uh, certainly there are challenges that come with prosperity. We want to remind you this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. If you've never been there, check it out, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. And if you've never sent us an email to let us know you're out there listening, we encourage you to do so. Questions at collegeview.com is the email address to use. Or if you'd like to send us a question or a comment about something you've heard on the Virtual Bible Study, we'd welcome that as well. Questions at collegeview.com. Dot com. We're talking about Lot and his example of righteousness. Lived in a wicked world, and certainly he wasn't perfect. Lots of, uh, we can look, cite flaws in his life, the mistakes that he made. Uh, but he's called righteous in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He's called a righteous man with a righteous soul. And that's an example for us, an encouragement for us in this wicked world that we live in. And I think a very important aspect of his life is what is mentioned there in Second Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. We alluded to it before the break. It's the fact that he was tormented by the wickedness that was around him. Notice again, Second Peter 2, verse 7, and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Lot was oppressed and tormented by the wickedness that was around him, and we just have to simply ask uh, the question of ourselves. Could this be said of us? Could it be said of us that when we see the wickedness around us, that it oppresses us, it vexes us, it torments us, 
Or would we have to be more honest and say, you know, when I see some of those things, I sort of think it looks good. I sort of think I, uh, the world might have it made when they get to engage in some of those things. Maybe it's the immorality, the, the way that they dress, the way, places they go, the language they use. It sort of looks appealing to me. Or does it oppress me like it did a lot? Those are some things that we have to think about in the wicked society that we live in like Lot. Yeah, which uh, it's definitely, I think it's uh, the world is full of, uh, I guess you could say, like just the uh, pleasures of like right now. I think it's, uh, they're the countless, countless uh, sins that uh, you can just get into by walking out of your door or turn on your computer. So it's just, we really need to harden ourselves and learn to uh, relearn, I guess, in some ways to hate sin and just to abhor the things that are evil. So it's something that's really... I like what you said there, Kyle, is teach ourselves to abhor. Maybe maybe we're not at that spot now. We've got to develop that reaction to sin like Lot had, is that it just, it oppresses us, it grieves us, it torments us. It's not something that we look at longingly, that we, we, we would uh, secretly wish we could engage in those sins, but instead they're repulsive and they, 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 they turn us away from those things. Maybe we're not to the point where we wishing that we could engage in those things, but I think another danger in the wicked society we live in and in, in, in in an attitude that the devil wants us to take and assume towards sin is, well, it's not that bad. I wouldn't do it, but it's not that bad. Just because we've been exposed to it over and over again, it no longer torments us. It no longer oppresses us or vexes us. It's just not that bad anymore. We've got to have the attitude that we hate it and that it, it, it defends us and that we uh, wish that it um, Psalm 119, verse 158 says, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. The psalmist, when he saw the wickedness in the world around him, he was grieved. He was saddened. Can we say that about ourselves? Are we grieved that the world is engaged in these sins? When we see people doing wrong, does it grieve us? We should have that attitude. It's the attitude that Lot had. It's the attitude that allowed him to maintain his righteousness in that wicked world. We've got to, when we see sin, it should grieve us. When we see people that are engaged in sin, it should grieve us. We should, we should feel guilt or feel sad for them. We should wish that they weren't engaged in those sins. Perhaps uh, a passage that we reference often, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes for, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. God's instructions are for our good always. And so when we see people that aren't engaged in following God, that aren't doing God's will, we ought to be grieved. We ought to be sad for them because they're not enjoying the benefits of the uh, blessings that come from serving God and doing what he wants them to do. I believe Lot viewed the society around him that way, is that he knew how they should be living. And he was oppressed. He was tormented because his fellow man was not... Uh, living like God would have him to live, that was not enjoying the blessings that uh, that God uh, desired for them, that would come as a result of serving Him. Huh? Yeah, which uh, I think that is, especially if it comes with uh, hardening ourselves uh, with, uh, against sin and the way we have this relaxed view now. It's just the simple things. Simple. I hate to say simple sin. There's nothing. There's no sin that's simple, but things that uh, we see our co-workers or uh, others who are involved in something that's obviously sinful, but we just, you know, we, you know, I don't want to start something at work. I'm not going to, you know, get into discussions. We're just going to let that go. We just need to, I guess, boldness. We need to make sure that we're going out of our way to make sure that we can just try to teach others, even if it's uncomfortable in the workplace or our neighbors who are having a party next door or, or going, right. going to a place that serves alcohol. And we're just trying to, you know, just, one to stay away from uh, environments that would cause us to sin, but just really, uh, we need to harden ourselves against that kind of thing. Yeah, we're not uh, we're not going to associate or endorse those activities and or go along. Maybe I'm not going to I'm not going to participate, but hey, I'll go with you, and we'll. And I'm not I'm going to sort of associate with you and think everything and act like everything's okay. No, it should grieve us. You know, when the psalmist says he beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word, they didn't keep God's word, they, he was grieved because they were not 
Perhaps he's grieved because they're not enjoying the blessings that God had intended to bless them with as a result of following his commandments. It's a similar attitude that Jesus expresses in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, when he was come near and beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. Uh, Jesus, when he sees Jerusalem, he's weeping over it because they are not following God, because they're being in transgression, because of the peace and the blessings that God had intended for them. They not, they're not realizing those. It causes Jesus to weep. We ought to have the same response to sin today. Lot had it. Jesus had it. The psalmist had it. When we see wickedness around us, it's not something we should look at uh, longingly, wishing that we could participate. It's not something we should look at and say, you know, they're not doing what God says, but that's not that bad. It ought to oppress us. It ought to torment us. It ought to cause us to be sad for those who are not living as they should. As Jesus was, we perhaps even should weep when we see those who are not in living like they should. It's something that we need to ask ourselves. It's how Lot maintained his righteousness in the wicked world that he lived in, and it's uh, how we can maintain it as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it, it's, this, is a, this is a problem for not just for those in the world, it's a problem for Christians, is that we can get callous to sin, that we begin to think it's not that bad. We can begin to think, you know, we can, there's nothing wrong with this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, beginning, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Notice this, they weren't oppressed, they weren't tormented, they weren't grieved, they weren't weeping over this. Verse 2, 1 Corinthians 5, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. So they're not mourning. They're not sorrowful that there's sin. They're puffed up. They've accepted it. And that's a problem and a challenge for us all in the wicked society that we live in today that we can begin to accept things that are wicked and wrong. Yeah, well, if we become to if we come to accept it, I think uh, we're also we'll, we could be sinning ourselves, but we're doing a disservice, I guess, to those who are around us. So we're just letting them we're sending to, we're sending them to the judgment without letting them know that they're doing wrong. We I think we just need to they sure they may know, but we that's an opportunity for us to reach out to them and say you know we just to make sure that we help them and try to correct them and reprove them. So it's, uh, we need to make sure that. When we're out there, we need to make sure that we're putting ourselves out there and making sure that they know that there is something better, that there is a better way to do and a better way to live. That's right. Uh, let's see, Kent in Calhoun, Georgia says, this reaction of Lot was a learned reaction. He had to be taught promoted conviction in his life against such sinful and wicked deeds. One of the great challenges that faces Christians today is to not become desensitized to sin. Some individuals Contact, uh, contact with sinful activity, both moral and doctrinal, activities to such behavior, and they are gradually pulled into accepting such perversion as being normal. Nothing really surprises me as to what is going on in both society in general and the Lord's Church in particular. There are times when I would not be surprised to see an ant crawl out and eat a bale of hay. Christians need to be on guard and not allow Satan to desensitize us to the horribleness of all sin, whether it be moral or doctrinal in nature, and appreciate Kent for his comments. Certainly, we can become desensitized, and one of the ways that we're being desensitized today is in the media, and we've got to stop and ask ourselves, is what we're viewing on television, what we're paying actors to act out and portray, portray to us in the movies, what we're reading about on the internet, what we're hearing about on the news, is it helping us to have the attitude that Lot had towards sin? Or is it helping to desensitize us, to make us think that, that this sin and this wickedness is not that bad? What effect is this having on us? Is it desensitizing or, or is it helping us to be oppressed and tormented and grieved and even weep over the sin that's in the world? Which effect is it having on us? If it's causing us to be desensitized, it needs to go. We've got to get it out of our lives because it's not helping us to have the attitude that we're commanded to have and the attitude that Lot had that helped him maintain his righteousness in the wicked world. And I'm afraid there are Christians, Kyle, who are falling 
to the temptations of the society because they're allowing themselves to be desensitized by the things that they're viewing in the media. Of course, that's, uh, that's, that's why I know we have uh, many members who go here who don't have, uh, especially a television, something that's actually a, putting and piping that into our homes, which it's, it is exceptionally dangerous. You know, it's for, for old Christians alike and young and your children. So it's, there's no age limit to how toxic a television can be. But we really need to be put everything through a, a spiritual filter. What are we letting in our homes? Uh, there's hardly anything on TV that is would pass. Uh, I don't think Paul would watch a television. I, just, I don't <laughs> think he would have the TV on much. Huh? So uh, I yeah. think we need to start opening up our Bibles a lot more. Doing there's so many reference. There's there are websites, uh, good uh, Christian bookstores who have multiple and just so many volumes of. Uh, not just your Bible, but there are many volumes of uh, information you can have just to, for Bible studies and just to, for regular reading. So it's just we need to make sure we're tapping into those as a Christian. So. If you don't think it's bad, do this. Turn it off for a week. Just turn it off for a week. That's all it's going to take to get, your, get, get the calluses softened up. Turn it off for a week. Turn the media off. Maybe it's the news. Maybe it's the Internet. The television. Turn it off and then come back to it after a week and see if it doesn't hit you in the face. The stuff that you were ignoring before that wasn't grieving you and tormenting you before because you were callous to it, turn it off for a week and see if it doesn't have an effect on you when you come back to it. And my guess is that if you'll do that, it'll stay off for longer than a week uh, because you'll realize the effect it's having on you. Uh, we've got to be aware of that. Guest 9583 says this has been manifested in the dress in the church. It's become far too casual. And so 9583 say, says our society is desensitizing us and callousing us to sin. We need to get a break. When we get back, we're going to go fast. Lot is an example to us. Living a righteous life in a wicked world, when we get back, his sacrificing to follow God is certainly an example to us. And his willingness to be in the faithful minority. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. I'm Dan Quillen, a member of the College of Church of Christ, with some thoughts about making plans. Have you made any different plans for your spiritual life and for your service for God? We spend time prioritizing personal lives and setting goals in our careers, but do we think in those terms about the most important thing, our soul? Ask yourself these questions. What am I planning to do for God today? In the coming week, what good thoughts will I accomplish for him? At this time next year, where do I want to be in my spiritual life? In five years from now, how will I have changed, improved, and grown in my work for God? Ten years from today, how will my family be? How will I have helped them grow spiritually? Twenty years down the road, how will I be doing? As I approach death, what will have been the most important things in my life? Where will I be in eternity? My name is Jim Meisner. I worship at the Church of Christ in Deckerville, Michigan. Be sure to listen to the virtual Bible study and watch it. Broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The virtual Bible study. Take it away, guys. We're back on the program as we look at Righteous Lot, and we need to go quickly now and look at some of his other examples. He was willing to sacrifice to follow God. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 and 13, as the men come to Lot, they say to him, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whom whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Uh, maybe we don't stop to think about all the things that Lot had to give up there. He had to give up his home. He had a home that he's inviting the, the, the men into, no doubt. That's gone. That's burned up. He's got friends, no doubt, in the, fam in the city. He's got family that didn't come out. Uh, he's got a livelihood there that he's giving up. And, you know, back in, in, he, in Genesis chapter 13, the reason that he and Abraham split up is because they had these extensive herds. They had m massive herds, and the, the land couldn't support both herds. So I don't, maybe he's retired from farming at this point. I don't know. But what about if he's still got the livestock? If he's that's, his, that's his livelihood, his possessions, his wealth. He's walking away from all of that because God told him to do that. He's going to obey God. We need to be willing to do the same. 
We've got to be willing to make sacrifices in order to serve the Lord. Matthew 19, verse 29, Jesus said, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Sacrifice wasn't just a first century concept. It was a concept in the Old Testament. It was a concept in the first century. And it's an expectation for us today that as we live in the world, we will have to sacrifice in order to be pleasing to God. Are we willing to make the sacrifice? As Lot was, he maintained his righteousness by willing, being willing to sacrifice. That's true, especially uh, we hold tight to our material possessions. I guess that's something that we really... Uh, it always comes to mind first when we think of sacrifice, I guess, today. So it's just, uh, we need to be ready to, I guess, just put away and put away even a, there could be a fantastic paying job. That's uh, right. Uh, maybe uh, in a location that's probably not suitable, that there may not be uh, necessary opportunities for worship there. So I think it's, you know, um, service to God comes first, obviously, in everything we do. So we need to make sure that we're thinking of that. If we go on vacation, we need to make sure that we're, uh, going somewhere that we can, if we're going to be in town on a night of worship, we'll make sure that we go into that and just make sure we're making an opportunity for that. So um, spiritual lives, our spiritual lives come first and foremost in our lives. So, Exactly, Kyle. We've got to be willing to make those sacrifices. Jesus says that we'll be rewarded for making those sacrifices, but he did say, you know, that's that's beyond the pale. I don't need you. That's too extreme. He look at what he's talking about. He's talking about houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children. We may have to make sacrifices along those lines of the most valuable things to us here in this life. We may be called upon to make sacrifices in those realms. Jesus didn't say, you know, that's, that's too extreme. I don't expect that. He says, if, you're do, if you'll do that, you'll be rewarded. It's, it's clear that sacrifice is going to be ex expected of us. It was expected of Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Paul's example... Jesus' example, they correlate with Lot's example of being willing to make sacrifices in order to serve God. Are we willing to make those sacrifices? We must. And Kent says Lot called, was called upon to sacrifice. He had to sacrifice his standing in the community, his wealth, his friends, and even his wife to escape the righteous judgment of God. At, we, at some point of, in time may be faced with the same challenges. In consideration of such, being called upon to sacrifice in such measures will be a trial to our faith. Being called upon to make sacrifices in the communities where we live may be, may be to the point of being difficult. However, when it relates to those we dearly love as family and friends, such can prove to be a real, uh, I think, challenge. We must uh, love our families, friends, and fellow brethren in Christ. We should always remember, uh, sorry, why we must love our fr family, friends, and fellow member, brethren in Christ. We should always remember that, we, that the love of God, Christ, and truth much t must take priority over loving others. And so uh, Kent's uh, drawing this idea of the fact that Lot had to make sacrifice even among his family. And... Uh, he says that we may be required to do the same today. And certainly, Lot's an example of being willing to do that. Yeah, especially uh, living as a Christian, doing, obeying the gospel, and just living the way we should. <clears throat> We're going to run into that a lot, especially in our own families, people who, like, uh, just don't agree with that, just who really have some really harsh views of uh, the way we live and the way we're the way we worship and the way we do things in our uh, as a Christian. So it's just families, you know, those could be divided over that. And it's, we need to make sure that uh, we recognize that our spiritual family, our, uh, that service to God and, uh, and Christ is exceptionally, extremely more important than uh, these worldly bonds and the things we have in this life. Even, sadly, even uh, spouses. It's something that we make sure that we make make sure we're making priority, make sure we can evangelize to our spouse and our family, make an opportunity, uh, even if we're not uh, in connection with our family, just making sure that they know that we're living right and we're more making sure that's our priority. So. That's right. Uh, Kyle, it's, uh, it, it, it has to be a priority. We have to be willing to make these sacrifices. Uh, certainly lots of good example for us in that uh, as 
as we all are, ch are called to make sacrifices in, in one form or another in order to be pleasing to God. Finally tonight, we want to look at Lot and his willingness to be in the faithful minority. You remember the account of Abraham pleading with God in Genesis chapter 18. You remember he starts with saying, God, are you going to destroy the city for 50? If there are 50 righteous people in the city, and God says, and he goes down to 45, to 40, to 30, to 20. He finally has to get all the way down to 10. And, and God says, I won't destroy the city for 10, if there are 10 righteous people there in Genesis 18, verse 32. Now, we can make some logical deductions from that. God made an agreement with Abraham. Sodom and Gomorrah would not be destroyed if there were 10 righteous people. They were destroyed. We can conclude that Lot was less than one in, or less than 10 individuals. He was in the group of less than 10 individuals that were pleasing to God in that city. He was in a, uh, by far, a, a very small minority, and he's willing to stay there and take his stand in that minority, and we've got to be willing to do the same. Uh, he's a minority. He's willing to be there. He's willing to take... Uh, rebuke and ridicule for being in that minority in Genesis chapter 19 verse 14 as Lot goes out and speaks to his son-in-laws and said up get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-laws they thought that he had gone crazy that he was he was uh, he was nuts the old man's gone crazy yet he's willing to take that stand he's willing to to be the one who looks crazy uh, in order to please God. He's willing to be in the faithful minority. And even those that escaped, the four that escaped, one of those even turned back. Uh, Lot's wife in Genesis 19, uh, 17 and 26. Lot's wife turns back. Lot certainly is in a minority, and he's willing to be there. And it's where we've got to be if we're going to be pleasing to God. And that, that shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be scare us. Kyle, it shouldn't be something that we want to avoid. We've got to be willing to take the stand in the minority. Yeah, which I guess, uh, I'll be honest, when I used to read this, I was like, you know, why is Lot even there? He's, he's surrounded by this wickedness. Why is it he just, why is he, he should not, he should not even be there. He should have been gone a long time yeah, ago. shame on him. But, you know, as you read it, as you put through it the, a lens of righteousness, he's, he, he remained. He stayed in that situation. He stayed, uh, he remained. He tried to. He persevered. He. It's obvious he was trying to. He called them his brothers. He was trying to save them. So, I think it's an ex example for us. If we're uh, we can't obviously we can't escape the world, we must live in it. We must try to persevere and try to save those who we can. So a lot didn't run. So I think uh, he had uh, a lot of opportunity. I imagine plenty of opportunity to run if he wanted to, but he chose to stay and persevere and try to uh, do what he can. I think that's what we have to do. All right, uh, we're out of time, but quickly, Jesus tells us to expect to be in the minority in Matthew seven thirteen and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You're never going to be in the minority if you're trying to be pleasing to God. You're going to, that's your lot in life, to be in the minority, like Lot was. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to be there? Are you willing to stand with God in the minority? Kent says, biblical devotion to that of truth automatically places us in the minority. As a matter of fact, the people of God have always been in the minority. We can gain courage and promote a willingness on our part to accept minority status by constantly reminding ourselves that the ultimate reward of eternal life and fellowship with God can be obtained, but that such comes at a cost of putting Christ first in our lives. Hebrews chapter 11 serves as an encouragement to God's people as proof that even though the sacrifice may be costly and difficult, such always brings eternal life. Thank you, Kent, for that email tonight and for your participation. Kyle, uh, certainly uh, we may not uh, look to Lot immediately when we look think about someone who's righteous who can provide examples to us of how to live a righteous life in a wicked world, but certainly there are uh, numerous uh, characteristics of Lot's life and the way that he lived his life in that wicked society that can be an encouragement to us, to encourage us to be pleasing to God in the wicked society that we live in today. 
Absolutely. I think it's, uh, like we said, he gets kind of a bad rap in many ways. So I think we need to make sure that we're not looking, uh, that we make sure we're putting ourselves under the same microscope. So we think uh, he persevered in his time, and I think uh, we need to make sure that we're persevering in the world we live in now. So we'll make sure we're staying strong and uh, serving God and doing everything we can to save others. Hey, and, and Lot was willing, able to do it. He was able to maintain his righteousness in that wicked society. The lesson for us is we can be righteous in the society we live in today. We just have to have the courage uh, to do what God would have us to do in the wicked society that we live in so that we can maintain our righteousness as well. Kyle, thank you for being here tonight and helping us get on the air. It was good to be here. Thank and you Thank me. you for being on the other end of the line. We hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word tonight. We hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.